In an earlier tutorial, we looked at the processes that can be used in order to select engineering materials based on their properties. But another important consideration is whether the materials that we select can actually be formed into the shape that we desire for a given component. So in this video, we're going to take a brief look at some of the manufacturing processes that can be used when processing metals, polymers, ceramics and composites. We're going to begin with metals by looking at forming, machining and casting processes. For polymers, we're going to look at moulding and extrusion. And for ceramics, we're going to look at machining, casting and moulding. But we're also going to talk about the process of sintering, which hardens our ceramics. And finally, we'll take a brief look at composite materials. One of the things that we've already learned about metals is that they tend to be malleable and ductile particularly our face centre cubic metals, including copper and aluminium. And we looked at how we might go about selecting materials based on their ductility. On the right hand side we have a chart which shows elongation against strength, and we use this chart to select materials which are most ductile based on their percentage elongation. Now we see for all of the metals here that their percentage elongation is relatively high, somewhere in the order of 20 to 30%. Now some of the metals that are less ductile, for example our irons and steels, they actually have a property called allotropy. And we've also looked at this in an earlier tutorial, whereby heating the iron or heating the steel would actually change it from a body centre cubic to a face centre cubic structure meaning that it would become more malleable and ductile. So we'd see the heated material move to the right hand side, representing a greater percentage elongation. So given that metals tend to be malleable and ductile, we can look at a number of different processes for shaping metals. And these processes fall into the category known as forming. And we have three types of forming process that we're going to look at. There are others, but we're going to focus on these three, forging, extrusion, and drawing. So here we have a basic diagram to demonstrate the forging process. And forging is basically deformation or plastic deformation under compressive forces. The example that we're looking at here represents hot forging. So this might typically be used to mold steel or iron. So the billet is heated and in doing so it becomes softer and more malleable. And what we have is two sections to a die, and within that die we have a cavity. Now by forcing the two sections of the die together under high force or high pressure, what we can actually do is force that piece of material to fit the mould. And that's exactly what we see in the case of forging. It's the shaping or forming of a material under compressive forces. So next we have extrusion. And again, extrusion is reliant on a piece of material or a piece of billet shown here being malleable and ductile. Because what happens in the case of extrusion, we have an applied force using a ram and that forces our material through a narrow die. So perhaps an easier way to visualize this is in terms of a syringe where we have a body of liquid that's forced through a narrow orifice. But it is important to point out that the material here during the extrusion process is still solid. So it undergoes a huge amount of stress. It needs to be very malleable in order to move through the die. And here we have the extruded product leaving the die on the right hand side. So next we have drawing, which is very similar to extrusion, except instead of the applied force being on the left hand side or forcing the material through the die, it's actually going to pull the material out of the other side of the die. So rather than a pushing force, we have a pulling force. Therefore, the material needs to be ductile in order to be drawn into a wire. So our metals can be processed using a range of different forming processes because they tend to be malleable and ductile. And where they're not malleable and ductile, we have a number of different allotropic metals which can be softened using heat. Now metals do have some other properties that enable us to process them. We have also said previously that metals are relatively soft. And the reason I say relatively soft is because they're soft relative to our ceramic materials. We've also said that they're relatively stiff, meaning they're not particularly elastic. And here we have another chart of stiffness against density. 
and we see that our metals are sitting towards the top of this chart. Note that the y-axis here is the Young's modulus or the stiffness, therefore materials sitting towards the top of the chart have a high Young's modulus and therefore a high stiffness. So if metals are relatively soft compared to ceramics and relatively stiff, they can also be processed using machining techniques. Examples of different machining processes are milling, turning and drilling. Now I have put CNC in brackets there. CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control and it's basically milling, turning and drilling done by a computer program. But let's keep things simple and look at milling and turning. And at the top we have three different images for turning processes. And in a turning process, the work or the job as shown is rotated and the cutting tool is brought into contact with the job. So in order for this process to work, the cutting tool as shown must be made from a harder material than the work or the job. A simple way to think of this is that the cutting tool is almost scraping away the material of the job. From a visual perspective, you might think of sharpening a pencil where the blade of the pencil sharpener needs to be harder than the wood of the pencil as it's going to scrape that material away. The next set of images at the bottom show milling processes and the difference with a milling process is that the job's stationary and the cutting tool rotates. But once again, the cutting tool needs to be harder than the job or the work because essentially what it's doing is scraping away the material of the work or the job. So once again, because metals tend to be relatively soft, or at least soft relative to various different ceramics, and relatively stiff, meaning they won't deform during this process, it means that we can process them using various different machining operations. So let's look at one final way of processing metals, and again the general property of metals here is that they have relatively low melting temperatures. Now it's important again to point out this word relatively low, because they only have low melting temperatures relative to the ceramics. We see here ceramic materials with melting temperatures in excess of 2000 degrees Celsius, whereas some of our metals have melting temperatures in the mid to high hundreds or low thousands. So to melt raw iron, we need 1482 degrees, which is still an incredibly high temperature, but it's still significantly lower than the melting temperatures of our ceramics. Now what this means is that we can actually process metals by melting them and pouring them into moulds. Now this particular process is known as casting and we have a few different types of casting. We have sand casting and we also have ceramic mould casting. The important thing here is that the mould must have a higher melting temperature than the material that's being moulded. So here we have a basic image of the sand casting process where first of all we produce our mould by surrounding our pattern with sand. When we invert that and remove the pattern we'll have a cavity within the sand that we can then fill with our molten metal. Once the molten metal has been allowed to solidify we can remove the mould and we're left with the casting. So next let's look at some of the ways we can process polymers. Now once again the general property of polymers that we're focusing on here is that they have relatively low melting temperatures. So in the table we have various different polymers and we see the melting temperatures ranging from 140 degrees C for polyethylene up to around 300 degrees C for polyvinyl chloride. So when we compare that to our metals and our ceramics these melting temperatures are very low. So once again, what that means is we can process polymers in the molten state. And we're going to look at two examples. The first and possibly the most common is injection molding. And the second we're going to look at is extrusion. And we've already mentioned extrusion when we talked about selecting materials for electrical cables. So for injection molding, first of all, this is actually a four step process. And I have some nice images here from Toolcraft to refer to. So the first step of the process is melting and during melting polymer granules are loaded into the hopper on top of the heated barrel. So the polymer will appear as small granules or pellets. Now when those granules move into the heated barrel they're going to begin to melt and they're driven forward using a screw. 
So as the screw rotates, it forces the molten polymer towards the front of the barrel. The second step is injection, and during injection, the screw is forced forward, which is going to inject the molten polymer into the cavity. So again, similar to a syringe, we're forcing molten liquid, this time molten polymer, into the cavity of the tool. So once the cavity is filled, we move on to stage three, which is cooling, and we'll have cooling channels running throughout the tool which circulate water in order to cool the mold. We need to wait until the mold is sufficiently cool in order to solidify. And then once that component is solidified, we move on to injection, where the two halves of the mold tool open and release the component. Now because this is a cycle, in the next step the mould tool would close and would repeat that process again. So for injection moulding to be used, we need to be working with the polymer in a molten state. Now the same is true of extrusion, and extrusion is very similar to injection moulding, but with a couple of subtle differences. Now the first difference is that the injection moulding process was cyclic. We go through the four steps, and then we return to the first step, whereas extrusion is a continuous process. But once again, we see our molten polymer, which is going to be fed into the mold using pressure or a lead screw. But we also have running through the center, our electrical cable. Now the electrical cable at this stage is just bare wire or bare metal. And as it moves from left to right through the tool, we're essentially injecting the polymer so that it surrounds the metal wire. So with this being a continuous process, the wire continues moving left to right, the polymer continues to be injected into the die, and as it travels through the die, it will cool sufficiently to begin solidification. And this process is continuous, meaning as long as the wire continues to be fed, and as long as the polymer continues to be driven by the lead screw, this process will continue without interruption. But as you can see, there's quite a lot of similarities there with the injection molding process. So next, let's look at ceramics. And much like with polymers, they need to be processed in a state other than their finished state. So the general properties of ceramics before sintering is that they're normally liquid, powder, or what we call the green form, which is like a wet form of the final ceramic. If we think of green concrete, we think of concrete before it's set. On the right hand side there, we see the example of a potter's wheel, where the clay is considered to be green because it still contains moisture. It hasn't yet been chemically bound or hardened, and that won't occur until it goes through the sintering or the firing process. So what this means, providing we're processing the ceramics in this green state, is that we can potentially machine them, we can potentially cast and mold them, and the ceramic won't obtain its final properties until after the sintering process. So once the material has been sintered, it will be very hard, very strong, very stiff, with a very high melting point. So all of the properties we would expect from a ceramic. Now it's important to point out that sintering is done at very high temperatures, somewhere in the order of 1500 to 2000 degrees C for certain ceramics. Not only does it drive off moisture, but it also drives off other impurities that would otherwise affect the properties of the final ceramic. So we've seen the example of green clay being moulded, and we should all be familiar with the properties of clay once it's been in the kiln and once it's been fired or sintered. It would become hard, strong, but potentially brittle. Another example of a ceramic is zirconia. And zirconia is used in dentistry for crowns, veneers and restorations. Now zirconia is an example of a material that whilst in its green state can actually be machined. So the zirconia in its green state will be machined, it will then be sintered and after sintering it will be very hard, very strong and very stiff. And as a final example we have carbon brake discs. Carbon brake discs would be formed in their powder state, so they would be cast or moulded in their powder state, and they would then be sintered in order to produce the very hard, very strong material that's required for the brake discs of performance vehicles. So finally, let's talk briefly about composites. 
Now it's very difficult to talk about composites as a whole because there's so many different varieties. On the left hand side here we see some of the examples that are used in the building industry such as reinforced concrete, plasterboard and even chipboard. These are all different types of composite materials. Reinforced concrete and plasterboard would use ceramic materials. Chipboard would typically use wood and polymers. And we also have their bathtubs and shower trays, which are manufactured from glass fiber reinforced polymers. On the right hand side, we have some more technical applications. And one example is the skin of an aircraft. They actually use a material called glare, which is glass fiber reinforced aluminium. So there we have a number of different composites. We have glass fiber reinforced polymer, and we also have aluminium. Next we have wind turbine blades, which can be manufactured from glass fiber or carbon fiber reinforced polymer. Next we have bike components, and on performance bicycles, many of the components would be made from carbon fiber reinforced polymer, typically the frames, the forks, the seat posts, and so on. Next we have performance vehicle components, which are also quite often made from carbon fiber reinforced polymer because of the high strength to weight ratios. So to summarize, one of the important things to look at is the properties of a given material and whether those properties are suitable for a given application. But in addition to that, we also need to consider whether we can form or shape the component that we desire. And this will be dependent on the manufacturing processes that are available to different classifications of engineering materials.